Can you guys hear me? You're working? All right. So, yeah, my name is Locke. I'm the head of digital content and strategy at the NFB. And today I'm going to talk to you about the opportunities at the NFB. And show, I'm going to show you some projects as well. But first of all, I just want to get a sense of the audience. Um, so who, who here is from the studio agency world? Just a hands. And designer developers? And then filmmakers, content creators? Nice, OK. So um, oh yeah, in any installation artists, data biz people? No hands? All right. So cool. So a bit about the NFB. The, um, the, you guys all know this, the NFB is the country's public producer and uh, has been engaging Canadians for over 72 years through the production of stories that reflect our country and Canadian points of view. You guys can hear that audio? All right. So we're one of the few remaining public producers in the world. And two years ago, we launched nine projects, some of which you'll see in the background here, just to give you a quick overview. River, and uh, we're studying the Beluga whales. This is a very threatened population. Our home is the biosphere. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59th minute. Most luck. Like. Oh, click. Click. Most click. Pine Point was the first place I ever went alone. I was nine, living in Yellowknife and went there for a hockey tournament. Adam League, 10 and unders. I don't remember much. This isn't the plane. My team's not on it. But it is Pine Point, around the time I was there. Dans la vie, je suis un programmeur de cette web. Moi, je suis étudiante en soins d'infirmiers. Moi, je suis euh, agent de sécurité. Donc, euh, la montagne, pour moi, ça représente le, le poumon de Montréal. C'est euh, la, la campagne en ville. Puis euh, j'essaie de me maintenir en forme. Je cours toujours sur la montagne depuis euh, une vingtaine d'années. I was in Halifax on vacation. That's where I met him. I was told he was the nicest guy in the world, but I didn't like him. My name is Amelia. I make music, um, write poetry, act, um, anything that has to do with entertainment. with us is greater than ever. Take example for this next, this next project called Blah Blah. It started as a, an interactive animation for the web. Now it's also become an interactive um, insta installation that you can go to and interact with in a physical space um, as well. So we work with Montreal artist Vincent Morissette, and he's the guy who made the first Arcade Fire um, interactive video when the album Neon Bible was released. So, Vincent created this project last, uh, which launched uh, this summer, and um, it's an interactive animation that explores the fundamental principles of human communication.
So each of the six chapters in the, in the story depicts a different aspect of communication, learning a language, making small talk, expressing emotions. It's rich in opportunities for discovery. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on here, uh, just because we're running a little late on time. So there's, then there's this Made in BC project that, yes, it includes David Suzuki, and, but it also includes our team, the vacuum from Nelson, uh, who built the interactive project for the web, uh, Sarah Fax from Vancouver, who built the iPhone and iPad app, and of course, great talent like Kim McNaughton, who shot this, and, um, and so the social media team on our end, and at the Suzuki Foundation, who helped get the word out. So you guys have probably seen this before, but it's, uh, it's an interactive parable that demonstrates the choices we make, and we're not unique in our choices and the things that we consume. The, um, the obvious question that to ask was, what would you do if you had one minute to live? But we knew we'd get answers like, I'd call my wife, call my mom, have sex. So we thought we'd get a bit more experimental and ask it this way. cities that we live in, the kinds of houses we live in, the market, the economy, currency, how many trees we're going to cut, how many fish we're going to catch. Those things human beings can manage and control because we create them and do them. But some things are facts of life. We have to live with the speed of light, gravity, uh, entropy, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Those are things that we have to accept and work ourselves around. And there is another one that is absolutely crucial. It's a mathematical reality called exponential growth. If something is growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% a year in 24 years. 4%, 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially will double in a predictable length of time. Now I'm going to show you why all of this stuff about we gotta keep growing, keep the economy growing, we've gotta keep everything growing, is ultimately suicidal. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet, and that's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is the planet, and the bacteria are us. Now I'm going to introduce one bacterial cell in, and it's going to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at time zero, at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, there are eight. Four minutes, 16. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left. So we have a 60 minute growth cycle. When is a test tube only half full? Well, of course the answer is at 59 minutes. Even though it's been chugging along for 59 minutes, it's only half full, but one minute later, it'll be completely filled. So that means at 58 minutes, it's 25%. 57 minutes, it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60 minute cycle, it's 3% full. At uh, 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, hey guys, I've been thinking, we got a problem. We got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So, say bacteria are no smarter than humans, at 59 minutes they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left, what are we gonna do? Well, don't give any money to those economists that are saying we gotta keep growing all the time. Uh, give it to those scientists. So they massively inject money into the scientific community. And guess what? In less than a minute, those bacterial scientists invent three new test tubes full of food. That'd be like us finding three more planets that we could use. What happens? In 60 minutes, the first test tube's full. 61 minutes, the second's full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food and space, we buy two extra minutes. Our home is the biosphere. It's fixed and finite. It can't grow. And we've got to learn to live within that finite world. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59th minute. So that's the test tube with David Suzuki. There's more, but I'm gonna just keep moving uh, for time. So adaptations, it's, for us it's a great opportunity. So take, take this project for example, uh, Pine Point. We originally made it for the web with type on screen, 
but when we had to perform it live in Amsterdam and South by Southwest and on a rooftop in uh, New York, we knew the audience would be able to read, wouldn't be able to read type clearly on the screen in a big in a theater environment. So we created a, a special adaptation for that. It's also potentially a book app, and um, there was also an album released by the artist who created the soundtrack, Besnard Lakes, on vinyl, and of course download. And uh, so let me introduce to you now the Goggles. So the Goggles are Mike and Paul, who are the former creative directors at, uh, at Adbusters. And they're going to do, um, they're going to perform the two laptop um, and a mixer version of Pine Point. On one computer is going to be the, <coughs> the website and the, the soundtrack. And on the other computer, we're going to be playing the narration. So welcome, guys. Mouse click. Tab. Five seven nine. Click. Mouse click. Backspace ten. first place I ever went alone. I was nine, living in Yellowknife, and went there for a hockey tournament. I don't remember much. The 45-minute plane ride, those giant propellers, the rink's blue lobby, and that's about it. This isn't the plane. My team's not on it. But it is Pine Point, around the time I was there. My family left the north when I was 10. We moved to Regina, and I became that kid who got A's and F's. The guy who didn't look forward to the day things would change. My name is Mike Simons. One night last year, I went online to see what had become of Pine Point. Turns out, Pine Point isn't there anymore. Really? The website I found was called Pine Point Revisited. This is what it looks like. Plenty of images of people and enormous trucks, big holes in the ground. It was a mining town. This isn't Facebook. The photos have scratches, wrinkles, and dust. They reminded me of my own family album. My dad died in 1999. When I try to picture him, I don't see him. I see photos of him. Though I had only stayed a short while in the actual town of Pine Point, I spent hours going through this memorial. The site was the least disingenuous thing I had seen in a long time. Looking in, it's hard not to think that it was a great time to be alive and up north, in a time before seatbelts and sunscreen, when you could still pull block-long wheelies without fear of consequence. The pictures are impossibly friendly. Even the colors and textures seem unselfconscious. Wood paneling, perms, velour, deep shag. It was maybe the last truly iconic era. The last time we went through the motions of change together. Everyone excited by the same things at the same time. I always found this comforting. Pine Point didn't have much in the way of phone book cover-worthy symbols. The water tower emerges as a constant lovingly portrayed over years and through seasons. I can't for the life of me remember what Regina's icons might have been. Maybe the SAS power building? Because it curved? The mine closed in 1987. Most industry towns, after losing their purpose, attempt resurrections, or just slowly wither away. In Pine Point, they decided to erase the town from the face of the earth. By the following year, almost everything had been hauled away, buried, or burned. Even the arena where they held their winter carnivals, home to my last little flickering memory, gone as though it never was. This place was planned in some other place. 
Pine Point had none of the organic growth of most towns, where things morphed to fit trends and tides of people. Instead, it was Economics 101. A. Build a town. B. Fill it with things that towns need. And C. Let the people in. If you mounted a social experiment on the creation of hometown memories, it would probably look something like the town of Pine Point. Isolated in an unforgiving landscape, and built with a singular purpose. In the end, it was left standing just long enough for a single generation to run through it. I decided to visit Pine Point again. On my way up, I stopped in Yellowknife to see what had changed in my old hometown. Turns out, not as much as you'd think. The houses I had lived in were all still there, pretty much unchanged. More channels. Furniture you can take apart. Though the families offered, I didn't feel any need to go inside. Wandering around back though, I was met with that incredibly specific Canadian Shield backyard. Stubby evergreens and assorted pokey shrubs. Great Slave Lake just beyond. Here, my memories are thick. Drinking tea with my dad atop our mountain. The time my brother kicked me in the face while climbing it. His foot slipped. I still have the scar to prove this. Yearbook photos are taken during a cruel time in our lives, when that single thing you're known for is enough to summarize you completely. Leaving through mine, I see the girl who attempted suicide, the klepto, the puke king, the smartass, me. After I met a few Pine Pointers, I found them in their yearbooks. Matana B. School, 1975 to 1980. My name is Kimberly Federoff. I lived in Pine Point from 75 to 84. Kim Castle had a job at the mine, but that's not what she's remembered for. Kim was the latest hairstyle, the newest dance moves, the eyeshadow and attitude of a wider world. She didn't need to know that Pine Point would one day shut down to know that she wasn't there to stay. In the meantime, though, even the smallest town needs some glamour. My name is Lyle Rennick. I live in Hinton, Alberta, and we moved to Pine Point in uh, 1970. Wayne and Lyle Herniak were separated by eight years. And, uh, Wayne was always headed for the mine. Lyle went the opposite and, uh, direction, as younger brothers often do. Till the, end. the closest he came was a summer job in high school as a guide for mine tourists. Every place has its current, its counter current. By his own omission, Richard was a piece of work. Bully is the first word he used to describe his teenage self. Every Pine Pointer I met remembered him. He pushed around one of the brothers and dated the beauty. He was an athlete, a woodsman, a ladies man, the guy you fear, loathe, and wish to have as a friend. Then I got big, big, big. I was addicted to work. Time passes and we'll be defined by our jobs, our families, our accomplishments. Who we were is still a part of who we are, at least to those who knew us when. As we lose touch, we're happiest when we get some minor update about the people from our past. Enough to know that they landed on the other side. Enough to touch up our mental portrait of them and forget about them. Until next time. Kim went on to fulfill her yearbook prophecy, ambition, to be a social worker. She still sings, though the costumes are archived in a tickle trunk in her basement. Her recollections of Pine Point are less quick to surface, but when they do, they're mostly happy. 
Lalan Way now runs three Timborans, nicely situated for success on the road to Jasper. Their relationship is, well, brotherly. That unique mixture of love and rivalry. They're proud of Pine Pointers, enough that they're going back to visit. What they'll be exploring there is the past. Richard remains larger than life. He has mellowed and come to terms with his new self. Just before leaving Pine Point, he found out that a pile of accumulating symptoms added up to the early stages of MS. He has no regrets or anger, though he's now a man who lives at the whim of schedules, lists, restrictions. It has focused him in other ways. Being from Pine Point has become one of his most vital characteristics. Richard loves the town. Maybe more than anything else in his life. After the infrastructure is built and the systems put in place, people move in, go to work, go to school, get married, have children, hold funerals. That town becomes a community. How long does a town have to be around before you make a souvenir spoon with its name on it? Longer than it takes for people to make the spoon rack, apparently. The town of Pine Point is the most carefully planned and modern community north of the 60th parallel. There's a sadness in mementos. They commemorate something that might never be again. A baby blanket. Or that one seemingly inconsequential object that you can't bear to get rid of, even though all it does is sit at the bottom of a box. For me, it's a candle holder my dad made. The only thing that would make me sad if it broke. The mine's owners produced a video. Pine Point Memories. The greens, however, are brown. And the fishing... Some objects hold the history that made them possible. People cared enough to name a group and have a badge made. Richard doesn't have a lot of keepsakes, but he does have a dozen hats from Pine Point in his bottom right hand dresser drawer. Hats that a younger version of himself once wore. He took the time to make sure each one looked good before we started filming. I remember January 24th, 1978. That day, a Russian satellite, Cosmos 954, crashed near Yellowknife. After the fact, I convinced myself I'd seen little glinty pieces falling from the sky. It was a bit of vanity, really. Like I had somehow orchestrated the whole thing. I suppose we all want to be involved. Pine Pointers recollect their past more acutely than I do. They have more stories to tell, and those stories have more details. Like, they know the whole guest list for every house party that happened 20 years ago. Well, that's how it seems. Anyway. That's one thing that was, you know, my fondest memories there was uh, just the sports that was there. We, we played sports 12 months of the year, you know. Hockey and then room ball in the winter, volleyball in the winter, basketball, um, baseball, golf in the summertime. Uh, so, I mean, you've got, you've got life, lifelong buddies that were teammates, uh, still. Richard told me a lot of stories about fighting. My favorite is the one where he punched a man who was chewing a toothpick. As the man fell to the ground, Richard snapped the still spinning toothpick out of the air. In Richard's memory, he's the undefeated champ. He was starting to pity and I let him go. Three guys caught the end of another guy and so was horrible. Paid off my brother and his hit count. And I remember Everyone remembers the day the high school burned down. For the adults, one of the pillars of the community was threatened. For the kids, having the center of your universe go up in smoke was equal parts nightmare and dream come true. Wake up, sweetie. Your school burned to the ground this morning. Pine Point is surrounded by dozens of otherworldly pits. Some are ringed with crumbled rock, others filled with cerulean pools. It's all very fountain of youth meets post-nuclear accident, 
and industrial beauty you almost feel guilty for noticing. Just outside of town, you'll find the former tailings ponds, a treeless gravel blanket that smothers color to the horizon. If all this manipulated geography had a footnote, it would read something like, they came here to work. From the moment an event occurs, it's simplified and purified in memory. We shave off the rough edges, and what happened becomes a story or even a legend. I shoveled 32 tons of sink in one day. I might have been more, but I always keep the guys like going faster, faster, faster. Pretty well worked herself out of the job. I remember one time that they had a Timmy took a picture of me, and when I'd stop, you couldn't see me from the steam coming off me. Did the fact that their task was so intensely primal, digging raw materials out of the earth, sharpen their memories of the place? Did anyone ever pause to think that the work of Pine Point was a metaphor for the future of the town? It would live on only for those willing to dig into history into memory. In good times, we're usually pretty optimistic. There will be growth, work, and markets will rise. When there's a downturn and headlines turn ominous, we might get a sense that a way of life is ending for someone, somewhere. I've never lost a job, or even been laid up. I'm pretty sure that every place I've ever worked is still open, except the North Kegel Regina, definitely closed. I don't think I've ever had a closure with mine, but I always, I always feel sad when I, like I said, when I tell somebody... Wayne Herniuk left before Pine Point closed. For him, the end meant he would forever be missing a touchstone. In its place, a bunch of loose ends. For me, it's weird to say that I don't have a hometown anymore because it's not there. I would like to say, yes, I, I'm from Pine Point, which I do, but I'd also like it if it was still there, just so that, you know, I, I don't know if I'd ever go back, but... It, it... For Kim, Pine Point became the kind of hometown we see in movies. The place she could leave behind, make her triumphant return to, aspire away from. She looks back at it fondly enough, though. When I look at people's faces in the old Pine Point photos, there's no sense of hesitation. No hint that they knew that one day, this all might end. What remains of Pine Point is an unfinished sentence. Thank you. 
considerations and effects. For instance, once it's gone, has it really truly disappeared? One day maybe I'd like to make a trip up there just to see it for myself. Because when I think of Pine Point, I still think of my, my home, the, the town, the rec hall, the, the arena, the, you know, all those places that we knew and had fun and, and I don't think of it. The government produces documents and forms you didn't know existed. Attempts to address the situation. Fine pointers got letters telling them their hometown would have its name removed from the map. Most of the homes were sold and moved to nearby towns. Pine Pointers can tour places like nearby Hay River or High Level Alberta and try to spot their old houses. An entire section of townhouses, Brown Town, named for its brown buildings, was moved to Hay River where it was basically abandoned. It's now that community's eyesore, and still referred to as Brown Town. You can go to Fort Resolution and skate the same ice rink I did when I first went to Pine Point. Turns out, the lobby is gray. It was never blue. A while back, someone found a basement that had somehow escaped the burial. You pull back an old sheet of plywood, crawl through a hole, and you're standing in the basement of the Pine Point Hotel. There are cleaning supplies, a room full of receipts and pay stubs, hallways with peeling paint, empty chairs. Then you return to the surface and the hotel disappears. I notice that Pine Pointers often feel a distinct need to be the last person to. At least four claim the final drink in the hotel bar. Pine Pointers still visit their hometown. Some travel thousands of miles to get there. They bring family, friends, they reminisce or introduce the place to people who've never been or were too young to remember or weren't born yet. Just over there, some proof that it all really happened. You create this, this uh, fictional <laughs> uh, community in your head over the course of the years, and what it tends to do is... is it Actions preserve take the best what might have been. The corner store will never become an Arby's. Your family home won't be painted, have an addition built, be raised to make way for a parking lot. Recollection will always be the most accurate version of that place and time. What we've created for a hometown may be the better choice. An online community and the memories I have I can go back there anytime I want, and it hasn't changed. You know, I know a lot of people like... Most night. Five, seven, nine. Click. Most click. What amazed most folks is that the Most town's click. least likely residents Five, stepped up to raise caretaker. Click. When Pine Point was shut down, Richard moved to Victoria to become a bouncer. But... It turns out he wasn't mean enough. Yeah. The fighter turned out to be a protector. He ended up yeah. working with severely handicapped kids, including kids with MS. Richard's limbs are useless to him now. He builds the Pine Point website using only his voice. It's excruciating yeah. to watch, slowly pushing pixels up an ever steepening hill. Most five. I suppose we all want a chance to edit our story, to keep the best stuff on top, Bury the rest. Decide how we'll be remembered by others. Six click. Backspace. Richard then? That guy who was always in fights. Richard now. He 
kept the town alive. They get together once a year in the Pine Point Bash. Over weekend, they set off fireworks, talk about a place that once was, find out what became of who, when. Richard still hopes to go, one last time. I can't help but wonder if Pine Pointers are in some way happier people, if there's a kind of relief in having their hometown gone and their memories cast in amber. I couldn't find an answer to that question. I haven't had their past. They haven't had my future. Do they wonder about the day the bash will come to an end? This year was cancelled due to conflicting functions. Someone still mows the grass in Pine Point Cemetery. stage data dancer who was um, who was just started with us I think a month ago data comes to us formerly uh, from dare interactive and then uh, Fjord West and um, he's going to be talking about what's coming up next uh, from us in the near future titles that we have some pretty exciting stuff coming. Uh, circa 1948, Stan Douglas is going to be an iPhone and an augmented reality app. I think that speaks for itself. It is it's going to be a very impressive piece. Uh, the stories we tell, Personal Never Heard Stories by Sarah Pauly. Uh, again, self-explanatory. And the one we're deeply embedded in right now is called Bear 71. This is going to be a very exciting multi-user project about the intersection of humans and animals and technology. So today we have a treat for you. We're going to give you a sneak, pre sneak peek of our latest yet-to-come public uh, project called Soldier Brother. Soldier Brother is an interactive documentary, a very personal story of a brother going off to war. Uh, it will be launching on Parliament Hill's 2011 Remembrance Day VIP event. when he started asking for a BB gun. And he just begged and begged my parents until they finally gave him one. So we went down the next summer and found that the cottage was just overrun with squirrels. But one afternoon, my mom sort of said, yeah, of course, go out, shoot squirrels. Obviously, never expecting him to get one. But he did, or sort of did. So my dad had to go out and, you know, and finish the job. I'll never forget how upset he was about the whole thing. I think about this story a lot these days. So I was thinking to talk a touch about our process uh, with this piece. And uh, uh, 
with the, how we work with the creator in this piece. So Caitlin Ann Jones uh, approached us with a story about, uh, about her brother going off to war and a story about disjointed communications, as well as the idea of working with a group of objects found in uh, his bedroom at their parents' house. Uh, from there, we, meaning Caitlin, Alicia Smith, the other creator, uh, and the NFB, decided to explore the storytelling possibilities found when a person encounters fragmented communications while seemingly living in this modern world where everything is connected. Um, this inspiration allowed us to explore three modes of communication that happened asynchronously, meaning the user's actions uh, dictate the order and coupling of what you're going to see. So each person, when you guys go and check this out, you'll see that you'll get a different story than any other user may. Um, and it leads to a degree of managed unpredictability. When I think about G.I. Joe, I think about my brother running around our yard when we were kids. We'd play in piles of leaves. He'd be wearing his plastic army helmet. And he'd be pretending to shoot me with a twig. I think about how he was always a soldier for Halloween. Sometimes he'd be a different type of soldier, but always a soldier. I know my mom worries about how things might be different if she just denied him some of his army toys, or if she'd encouraged him to play with other things instead. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a Ghostbuster, and then I wanted to be an artist. Although for him, there was a brief period in there where you know he wanted to be a dump truck driver, other than that, he's always wanted to be a G.I. Joe, and uh, now he is. So the second mode of communication is uh, through Caitlin's text messages, as we'll see here. I wanted to introduce him to, to what I thought was good music, but I'd moved away from home, and I missed him growing up between 13 to 17, so by the time I came back, he was obsessed with appetite for destruction, which is not, like, would not have been like the foundation record I think he should be listening to. He still has a larger than life poster of Axl Rose in his bedroom. And I can remember going up there and he would have like the music cranked and he'd be playing his favorite song, Rocket Queen. Really loud example of 90s rock fervor where it's like, Axel will come in screaming and he's like, if I say I don't need anyone, I can see. Go check that one out, it's good. Uh, but that one's really showing the, the fragmented communications with her and brother. Unless my brother has an undiagnosed issue with his gag reflex, I'm pretty sure he has what amounts to a mental block when it comes to swallowing any type of pill. I've seen him crush them and mix them into other things just to try to get them down. I've tried to coach him through it, but generally I just end up making fun of him about it. But I have to admit it was pretty jarring when I saw his army kit getting packed and there was a bottle of uh, children's vitamins in the mix. Hey, can I have your number? It's, it's just between you and me. I just, I just need somebody to talk to right now. And the third very emotional side of this project is when uh, Caitlin actually talks directly to you via text message. So this whole thing's going live uh, November 11th, 11, 11, 11. And to see and hear this experience, uh, go to nfb.ca slash interactive. Thank you, Dana. So, so I'm just going to, I think we have a few minutes left. Um, some of our partners we work with to date, um, companies like Jam3 Media, The Vacuum, Secret Location, Switch United, Burn Kit in Town here. We work with many freelance designers and developers from Halifax to Vancouver. So um, what's, uh, yeah, what's next? So we're taking proposals, so come talk to us or send us proposals at interactiveproposals at nfb.ca. We're also looking for creative par partners, so talk to Dana, or uh, send us an email. And how, yeah, how do you work with us? So we, 
One way to work with us is as a creator, if you're a, a content person, filmmaker, and, and you come and work with us, and we perform the role of the creative producer, and we'll work with you to develop the idea, refine a budget and a plan, and make it all happen. Another way is to work with us as a partner or a co-producer, so that relationship can exist, uh, where if you bring some money uh, to the table as well, whether it's funding from the CMF or um, for other sources, that's an option as well. So, um, and we've done various, various um, combinations of all of that over the last three years and um, definitely hope to do more. So those are our URLs. Thank you very much.